Hola one more time, amigos. You know who this is, so I don't even have to say. Well, it's it's the cliche. Hello, this is Randy Jimmy James Bowles broadcasting from the lower part of Queen Anne, which we're supposed to call Uptown, in Seattle, Washington. And I do have one more Mexican-themed story to relate to you, which I will read to you from my blog, I wrote this story about something that really happened. Every single word is true. And uh, I hope you enjoy it a whole lot. It's one of those stories where you don't need to actually see it. But if you want to, you can go to my blog. You can go to my blog or you can search Juan is Dead, WordPress, Randy Bowles. And you'll get to it that way. But you can just close your eyes and sit back and let me speak to you. And I will relate the story to you exactly as it happened many, many, many years ago. I don't know why. I don't know whether it's the lecithin I take or what it is, but I seem to be able to remember things that happened to me in detail so, so many years ago. And this happened like 1970 in a little town called Yakima, Washington. I was born here in Seattle. Then I like to say my parents kidnapped me and took me to Yakima. Then they brought me back home. To Actually, I brought myself back home in 1974. And I've been here ever since. But I grew up in Yakima, which is a very, very different community from the one I find myself living in at present and for most of my life, in fact. Let me read you the story. Just sit back and enjoy. It's called Juan is Dead, a Yakima Tale. And uh, the screen's going to get brighter. My face is going to get bigger. And here we go. In 1970, having just turned 21, I rented an apartment in a little triplex building on 2nd Street in Yakima. Other than the brief time I spent living in Hollywood, California when I was in the teen band, The Velvet Illusions, this was my first time living away from my folks. I was close with mom and dad, and I was kind of late getting out on my own. The apartments in this building, located near downtown, were not luxurious in any way. They were quite old and quite small, but we had a kind landlord who kept everything in working order. They were a whole lot better than nothing. My next-door neighbor was a fairly young Mexican or Mexican-American woman named Rosa. She was about 35 years old. Rosa had five or six small children. The boys and girls ranged in age from about two to eight or nine. Big sister was certainly no more than nine. Little brother had had just entered the talking stage. Rosa and the kids, along with Rosa's tiny grandmother, lived in the cramped little apartment right next to me. They had a dog and maybe a cat or two. It was a long time ago, so some of the details are faint. Rosa didn't have a telephone. Back in 1970, not everyone had a phone. I know that might seem odd, but it was the case. It was a matter of money. Rosa asked me to give her my phone number so she could call me in case of emergency. And every once in a while, I'd get a call from her. She'd usually have a message for me to relay to her family. Something along the lines of she would be getting home later than usual Nothing too serious. Rosa was really into traditional Mexican music. She obviously loved it because she played it all the time. She especially liked to listen to it late at night when her boyfriend would visit. In the middle of the night, through the thin walls of our building, I could hear Rosa and her man laughing, dancing, and spinning Mexican drinking songs, ranchera, and polka records. And this used to drive me crazy. The rancheras featured a crying vocal style. They were mournful dirges and not at all pleasant to listen to at 2 a.m. when I was trying to get some sleep so I could make it to my crappy Holiday Inn desk clerk job. Then the polkas would kick in and they'd be like some sonic whiplash, very fast and punctuated by squeals, laughter, shouts. I remember pounding on the wall several, on several occasions trying to get Rosa to quiet down. I really needed to sleep. 
And maybe I was just a little jealous because she was having a great time with her lover, drinking beer, dancing on the apartment's bare wood floors, ultimately falling into a lover's embrace. And there I was, all alone. Sometimes when my pounding on the walls didn't get Rosa to turn down the music, I would crank up my own stereo and put on my most psychedelic records. I'd turn them up very loud in order to not just drown out her music, but to send a message. It wasn't very nice of me, but I guess I was trying to scare her. Actually, I was probably scaring someone else entirely. You see, Rosa and I had another neighbor, a very old woman, who lived in the apartment behind us. I can only imagine what it must have been like for the old lady to hear a traditional version of Silito Lindo and Pink Floyd's set the controls for the heart of the sun simultaneously at 2 a.m. Okay, enough background, would you agree? Okay, on to the heart of Rosa's story. One night around 10 p.m., my phone rang, and it was Rosa. She was very distressed, crying, talking rapidly. I could barely understand her through her sobs, but the message eventually came through, and it was tragic. Rosa was calling from St. Elizabeth Hospital. She needed me to go next door and tell her family that someone named Juan was dead. There had been a car crash and he was gone. She told me to prepare myself because everyone would be extremely upset. She asked me to be very gentle with the kids and grandma. I promised I would do my level best to break it to them gently. Well, I was only 21 years old, and I was going to have to do the very grown-up act of informing Rosa's family of Juan's death. Thankfully, I've always been good at keeping a cool head during trying times. I knew what I had to do, and I set out to do it. I went next door and knocked on the weathered front door. Rosa's grandmother opened it. I said, I've got some really bad news for you. Rosa needs me to tell the whole family something. In broken English, Rosa's grandmother asked me in. She then went about collecting the children. She hurriedly gathered them together in the living room, where everyone sat on the old couch and a few wooden chairs. And there I was, a young man facing all these kids and a little old Mexican lady whom I hardly knew, about to tell them something so bad. I started breaking it to them as gently as I could. I said, I have something sad to tell you. Your mom just called me, and she told me something really sad. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but I have to. So I want you all to get ready to hear me out, okay? I stopped for a minute to compose myself and to allow everyone a little time to brace him or herself. Then I said in the softest, kindest voice possible, I'm really sorry, you guys, but your mom said for me to tell you that there's been a very bad car accident. And Juan is dead. Well, for a moment it got very quiet in Rosa's living room. No one made a sound. Then the little kids all looked at each other. They looked over at Grandma. Grandma looked at them. And then everyone looked at me. And they all blurted out, all at once, Who's Juan? 